What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, we're going to check out another five crazy butterfly effect stories in wrestling. We checked out um, uh, another video from uh, Wrestling Flashback. He, uh, we checked out the, uh, the crazy butterfly effects in wrestling. So, he has some more uh, to talk about. So, this should be a good one. It's crazy how one thing happens and it changes the course for someone's career. Someone's career can be made off of just one incident. That's how that's how funny the wrestling world can be, man. So this should be a good one. Appreciate all the love and support you guys are showing on the channel. Subscribe to Wrestling Flashback if you haven't already. Link to the original video is down below. Let's do this thing. One, two. Is this song? In wrestling, so much can change as a result of one incident. Injuries and suspensions can derail a wrestler's push, while a backstage moment can create a push. A match and a single tweet can help spawn a promotion. These are examples of the butterfly effect, which suggests that a change in one small event can have a big impact, leading to a much larger event taking place down the line. In our last video, we saw how John Cena's freestyle at the back of the bus on a European tour was seen by the right person and ended up spawning a gimmick that helped Cena reach the main event. We also saw how one tweet set up a chain reaction of events that changed the wrestling world forever, leading to the creation of AEW. And in one of the most emotional moments in recent history, we saw how an unfortunate injury to Mustafa Ali ultimately led to the rise of Kofi Mania. So join us as in this video, we look at five more crazy butterfly effect stories in wrestling. Before we get into the list, this video is kindly oh, sponsored one, by Raid Shout Shadow out to Legends. him getting his if you back, haven't yet heard Contracts with WCW, Diesel and Razor Ramon bowed out of the WWF in May mm -hmm. 1996, with both of their final matches taking place on a Madison Square Garden house show. Following the main event, Diesel and Razor said farewell to the WWF fans alongside fellow members of the clique, Shawn Michaels and Hunter Hearst Helmsley, with all four men sharing a moment in the ring together in what would become known as the curtain call. It was a rare sight to see baby faces and heels being friendly with each other like this, so upon seeing this, the fans in the building reacted in a big way, while also saying goodbye to Diesel and Ramon. Despite the click getting permission from Vince McMahon, the kayfabe breaking nature of the curtain call caused uproar backstage. This forced McMahon's hand into punishing at least one person from the group. Mm -hmm. And since Razor and Diesel were gone and Michaels was a top star and current it WWF champion, H. the person that ended up being punished was Hunter Hearst Helmsley. And it caused such an uproar that Vince had to do something about it. And the next day, um, he did something to me about it. Helmsley had been penciled mm -hmm. in to win that year's King of the Ring tournament, where Helmsley would have received a push off the back of his victory. But following the curtain call, this plan was erased. Helmsley was instead moved down the card for several months. The King of the Ring crown and subsequent push was instead given to Stone Cold wow. Steve Austin. <laughs> That's so wild, bro. Because of that, even though he got a approval from Vince, people were like, yo, what the fuck? Breaking kayfabe. Around this time, people were still buying into wrestling as real, real storylines, real beef for the most part. So Triple H was not the odd man out to get punished. And because of that, we got Stone Cold being the guy to get pushed that King of Ring. Oh, that is insane. Austin, who upon winning the tournament, delivered wow. one of wrestling's most iconic promos. Austin 316, 316 says just, I, I just whooped your ass. ass. When it came to creative, Austin wasn't an overnight success following King of the Ring, but he continued to make waves before kicking into high gear at the end of 1996, mm -hmm. wrestling an exceptional match against Bret Hart at the Survivor Series, and then winning the 1997 Royal Rumble after Austin last eliminated the Hitman. This set up another match pitting the two against each other at WrestleMania 13. The plan had initially been for Bret to face Shawn Michaels at Mania in a rematch from the previous year's show. However, Michaels' apparent injury resulted in the Heartbreak Kid being replaced with Austin, making this the second second time in less than a year mm -hmm. that Austin stepped into a big role despite not being the original first choice. Yep. Many have speculated that Michaels feigned the severity of his injury so that he didn't have to lose to Brett. I was told in August that it was me and Sean at WrestleMania 13. You know, he was going to retire because of his knee. It just seemed so uh, made up at the time. Austin was put in a career-defining performance mm -hmm. against Brett. And if it wasn't already clear that Austin was a force to be reckoned with, then this match more than proved it. One year later, the Austin yep. era officially began as he captured his first WWF Championship, defeating Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 14, the very man that Austin took the place of at the previous year's WrestleMania. So Stone crazy, Cold benefited bro. from Hunter Hearst Helms' That's punishment so from crazy. the call in 1996. And then to legitimately became a mega star because of one situation and everything falling into the place for it. it was it's one of those things some people are just destined to do great things it was it was just destined for stone cold to be one of the biggest draws in wrestling history bro 
took advantage of Shawn Michaels injury in 1997, Austin's King of the Ring triumph and more specifically his WrestleMania 13 performance served as launching pads that rocketed yep. the rattlesnake to the very top of the industry. Alundra Blaze's firing influences the screw job and Mr. McMahon. In 1995, oh. the WWF were in financial trouble and as a result were forced to cut back on numerous expenses. This included the talent roster with Vince McMahon making a business call to strip back the women's division, allowing the women's champion Alundra Blaze contract to expire in the process. This angered Blaze who left the company with a title belt still in her possession due to the company Damn. forgetting to ask her to give it back. Her release wow. acted as the beginning of a series of events that ended up affecting the wrestling world in a big way. Although Alundra eventually came to terms with Vince's decision to let her go, it still left a sour taste in her mouth. So upon signing for WCW and readopting the name Medusa, she made it known to WCW president Eric Bischoff that she still had the WWF women's title. Eric wasted little time in debuting Medusa, booking her to appear on the December 18th, 1995 so Nitro, where she opened the show by taking mm -hmm. the WWF women's title and throwing it into the trash can, creating one of WCW's most shocking moments. Medusa's yep. trashing of the title proved to be a massive shot fired in the Monday Night Wars, and her appearance on Nitro also influenced Vince McMahon's decision two years later to orchestrate wrestling's biggest screw job. That set off a chain of events behind the scenes as well as what you saw play out on camera. Mm. WWF champion Bret Hart was unwilling to drop the title to arch rival Shawn Michaels since Michaels had previously... Ah, uh, that makes sense because they forgot to ask her. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They didn't care that much. They forgot to get the titles from her. So when she went to WCW and did that live on television and threw the trash, I mean, uh, <laughs> threw the trash, threw the title in the trash, Vince probably was worried that a, um, that uh, Brett was going to do the same thing, even though he, he said he was going to drop it that night or that Monday night before he left or whatnot. And Vince wasn't sure. He thought, you know what I'm saying? It's crazy. It's crazy that Vince didn't trust him to, you know, go with the plans. Like, so he double crossed him and was going to screw him over to make sure that the title was not going to you know go to wcw and i don't think brett would have did that i don't think he would have just been spiteful like that or whatnot even though they already agreed to for him to drop the title on monday night i don't uh, you know what i'm saying it was one of those things where it's like it's a different situation because you know he's gonna drop the title the next night that was the plan i believe and he was like, nah, screw that. <laughs> Damn. Said he wouldn't do the same for Brett. McMahon believed Brett was the one being unreasonable, so Vince instead agreed to screw Brett out of the title, calling for the bell when mm -hmm. Michaels had Brett in the sharpshooter, despite Hart never submitting. Brett had been booked to retain the championship as a result of a disqualification, only for him to be screwed instead. But had mm -hmm. Brett retained, many have said McMahon was afraid of Brett Hart showing up on WCW with the WWF title, just like Medusa did with the mm -hmm. women's belt in 1995. The Medusa incident had proved Bischoff couldn't be trusted and Eric's subsequent acts of giving away finishes to WWF's taped shows yep. live on Nitro proved even further that Bischoff would do whatever it took to yep, get one over the WWF doing. to maintain WCW's but that ultimately advantage. Backfired a week on after him. Survivor Series, Vince was interviewed on Raw where he doubled down on the screw job, stating he was left with no choice but to do what he did, pinning the blame fully on Bret Hart with the famous line Bret screwed Brett. Brett. Brett screwed Bret. I have no sympathy whatsoever for Bret. The implications of this interview were massive. McMahon had just made himself the biggest heel in the business. Yep. The WWE audience was bull at Mr. McMahon for what had happened. I know. I'll be who they want me to be. Sure, the WWE... And it worked in his favor because he definitely, bro, people hated him because that was a real thing. He screwed them over. It was a real thing. That wasn't... That wasn't a work. He legitimately screwed them over because they had agreements on what they were going to do when it came to the title. And it just, if he fed into it, it worked. He became one of the greater, greater, the greatest heel character because of it. You know, it just propelled them even more for people to hate them. Lost arguably their biggest star, but in the process, they had gained perhaps their greatest villain as yeah. the man character was born. And it was just one month later that Vince would introduce the Attitude Era, Vera. a move to an edgier and risque product that ultimately defeated WCW once and for all, with McMahon's feud versus Stone Cold yep. Steve Austin being one of the key ingredients that made yep. fans switch over that's, to that's WWF War. This brings us back to when Alundra Blaze was told her WWF contract wasn't going to be renewed. It sparked an incredible chain reaction of events. 
from Alundra showing up on Nitro and throwing the WWF women's title in the trash to fire one of the first major shots at the WWF in the ratings war. To the WWF screwing Bret Hart in fears of Eric Bischoff once again sticking it to the company on TV as he did with Medusa. To the creation of the Mr. McMahon character mm -hmm. as a result of screwing Bret. All the way to the Austin vs. McMahon feud that helped the WWF. Yeah, I don't know why he's doing that glitching stuff again. I'm sorry, y'all. I do not know why it's doing that. Hold on, let me uh, let me try to fix that real quick. All right, I'm back, man. Hopefully it's fixed. Hopefully it's not doing that still. Let's get right back into this one. This this is pretty good video. Yeah, I was not trying to do that. WF defeat and conquer WCW in the Monday Night Wars. Jeff Jarrett being owed money leads to the launch of TNA. Next, oh. we have another example of a wrestler nearly leaving the WWF while still one of the company's champions. But to understand this case, we first have to go back to 1998 and the start of 1999, when Jeff Jarrett felt he had been shortchanged in terms of pay on multiple house show loops and pay-per-views. As his pay had been disproportionate compared to the wrestlers he'd been working with at the time. Then, towards the end of 1999, Jeez. the WWF were unwilling to give Jarrett oh. a raise on his current contract, which was set to expire. I thought I was gonna get a big bump in pay. Why the hell he going rogue on these women, man? <laughs> yeah, I'll say that diplomatically, and that just wasn't coming. This meant Jeff had leverage over the WWF since he was going into his final night with the company at no mercy as Intercontinental Champion, made worse by the fact that Jarrett chose to sign with WCW the next day. Comparisons can be drawn to our previous example with Medusa mm. and the Women's Championship, and especially Bret Hart and the WWF Championship, as Vince was once again put in an unenviable situation. McMahon either had to pay up or risk the consequences. Head of Talent Relations Jim Ross believed $150,000 was a suitable compromise between the WWF and Jarrett. However, Jeff wanted that number doubled to make Damn. up for the money he lost when the company made him take a pay cut in 1998. Due to Damn. missing a large number of live events in 97 and 98, as a result of Jeff staying home to take care of his wife who was recovering from cancer. We're thinking 150. I said, Jim, let's double that and get me to 300. The WWF had no choice but to agree to Jarrett's terms or risk him not working the show. Damn. Jeff didn't unpack his bags from his car until a deal was reached. Once the two parties came to an agreement and Jarrett brought his stuff into the building, it was the job of Mark Carano to follow Jeff and the Intercontinental title just in case Jarrett left with the belt. On the wow. pay-per-view, Jeff defended the title against China. In That's a crazy. There's like, nah, you gotta follow him just to make sure he don't fucking leave. Hey, and back then, 300K... Is probably maybe, you know, maybe with inflation and stuff like that, possibly maybe 500K. But let's do the math on it because, I, I, you know, that's what Google's for. Um, let's say 300K in like the, the mid 90s. You know what I'm saying? Just 300,000. We're going to do this live. Nineties. Let's say I'm looking at it right now. If it's like 1990, let me do, I'm going to do 1995 or something like that. Just do 1995. See what it says. Doing this drive. Yeah, I was right. 300K in 95 would be almost $600,000. It's actually roughly around $594,000. So I was in that ballpark, 500,000. That would be half a million with inflation today. So I can understand him won 300K back then. <laughs> a good housekeeping match. That's just Double J ended up losing, meaning China was the new intercontinental champion. The next night, Jarrett appeared on WCW Nitro attacking Buff Bagwell with a signature guitar shot. Oh, the wait a minute. The next time, Jarrett was brought Hold up on, on. The next followed Jeff and the intercontinental title just in case Jarrett left with the belt. On the pay-per-view, Jeff defended the title against China in a good housekeeping match. Double J ended up good losing, meaning China match. was the new intercontinental champion. I forgot. The next night, yeah, Jarrett appeared on WCW. She definitely was. She did become the uh, intercontinental champion <laughs> Crazy. CW Nitro attacking Buff Bagwell with a signature guitar shot. The next time Jarrett was brought up on WWF television was when Vince McMahon fired Double J on the night of the Raw and Nitro simulcast in 2001 after Vince had bought WCW. The public firing was McMahon's way of getting back at Jarrett for holding him for money two years prior. Mm. Capital G, double O, double N, double E. Gone. 
There was no Damn. chance of Jarrett returning to the WWF, who now had no competition following their acquisition of WCW. Jarrett instead started up a new promotion, Total Nonstop Action. Jarrett used the money he received from holding up Vince in 99 wow. to partially fund TNA. The company emerged as a challenger brand to the WWE, where we would see plenty of familiar faces. Which TNA is also crazy. allowed new up and coming talents to ply their trade and make a name for themselves. All in all, WWF's decision to shortchange Jarrett and then reduce his salary ultimately had a much bigger impact than anyone would have thought. Jarrett's decision to hold up the WWF it for pretty the much helped create TNA. Kind of some of the same similarities to with Cody and the creation of AEW. Money he was owed meant that there was no hope of the company bringing him back after WCW folded. But from there, Jarrett started his own promotion to slot in as the number two wrestling company in an example of one of wrestling's most That's unique wild. butterfly effects. Matt Hardy's injury results in Edge's rise. In late uh, 2003, Matt Hardy made boy. the jump to Raw for SmackDown <laughs> in order to be on the same we brand know about as his this girlfriend one. Lita, who had recently returned from injury. Over the next number of months, the two appeared on television together, featuring in a storyline with Kane. However, things began to stall for Matt after he suffered a torn ACL. In in the summer of 2004, mm -hmm. this ruled him out indefinitely while Lita continued her storyline with Kane. The injury alone will have already been a big blow for Hardy, but it would end up having much bigger implications as oh the months boy. progressed. To save herself from going on the road alone, Lita began traveling with Edge, a good friend of hers and Matt's. Lita and Edge gradually became closer and closer, leading to the two having an affair that Matt eventually found out about. Mm -hmm. This caused trouble behind the scenes between the three that affected things at work and came to a head when Matt Hardy was released from his WWE contract on April 11th, 2005. This came after Edge had his tire slashed following a house show in the Carolinas. They thought that I automatically either did it, I didn't. The office, I think that was the final straw and like saying that there was gonna be too much trouble and that I was gonna end up being released. Loud, you wow. screwed Matt Chance, rang out during a- And it's just one of those things, bro. This, is, this was a real thing that they ultimately turned into a storyline that ultimately catapulted Edge to the main event scene. Like, Think about that. My man's got it. Got with his friend's girl while they on the road. While Matt is hurt. And because of that, they use this real life story, this real life situation, and it ultimately catapulted Edge. Because now he had become one of the biggest heels in the company. Everyone thought he was a piece of garbage. <laughs> That's crazy. An in-ring segment involving Lita. You screw Matt. You screw Matt. Lita would then become romantically involved with Edge yep, on television, they, which they only capitalized. added further fuel to the real life fire while also enraging fans even more, to the point where the demand for Hardy to come back couldn't be ignored. That's a man's wife! What the hell are you people doing in here? <laughs> this return came to fruition oh, on the July so 11th good. Floor, with Matt returning to attack Edge whilst being restrained by security. Oh, this is so good. You Hardy, Edge, and Lita's real-life drama began to play out on mm -hmm. screen with the infamous Bite This interview that gave fans a peek behind the curtain, which put even more heat on Lita and Edge. <laughs> when I was out hurt, you stupid bastard, you lying coward, what did you do? You did everything you could do to get inside my girl's head and inside her pants. The feud spawned a series of memorable oh matches, including God. the Cage match at Unforgiven oh 2005 and the Loser Leaves Town ladder match on the Raw Homecoming show. The ladder match acted as the culmination of the Love Triangle storyline, but for Edge, this was only the beginning mm -hmm. of his rise to the top. With Lita by his side, he became the rated R superstar, superstar a yeah. character built on sex and violence. But it wouldn't have been as effective without Lita, who nope. added another dimension to Edge's character. If there was such a thing as a missing ingredient to Edge's character, it was she Lita. was it. I think it brought them both to the next level. A missing piece that finally propelled him to the main event, where he won the WWE Championship for the first time in his career. Edge and Lita continued to feature in risque segments, cementing themselves as one of the WWE's greatest ever couples. Perhaps. And even after Lita's retirement and the couple's real life split, Edge remained a major player, racking up more and more world titles. Mm -hmm. Matt Hardy's injury in 2004 put a strain on he and Lita's relationship that Edge took advantage of. Then, when reality blurred into storyline, Edge embraced the heat, becoming one of WWE's most hated heels along with Lita, a pairing that proved to be a key component in Edge's rise to the main event. Ro and that's how you do it. And I, I want to make a comparison here. The real life situation with CM Punk and the EVPs and uh, the Young Bucks and Adam Page and Kenny Omega. Use it. Make a storyline out of it. That's what makes some of the best wrestling stories the greatest. If there's some truth behind it, people buy into it. Use it.
I hear rumors they're trying to split the roster now uh, to make another show for AEW on Saturday nights that CM Punk can be a part of. So they're going to split the roster. What are y'all doing? Do this. Use the, the you ain't got to be best friends, but use that tension, that real life tension, turn it into a storyline, make the company and everybody some money. It's the simplest thing, bro. My, the fact that Matt was in a real relationship with Lita for all those years for Edge, his friend, to stab him in the back and for him to legitimately be able to still be a professional, even though it probably wasn't like that, but when he got hired back, for him to be a professional and to watch his real-life ex be on camera tonguing down Edge and to still have those matches and those feuds. Come on, bro. Come on, man. That's all I'm saying. Make it work, AEW. Roman Reigns' illness leads to a title unification and WrestleMania problem. WWE's day one event in 2022 was to have mm -hmm. two massive title encounters. Big E Big was set e to defend better. his WWE Championship in a fatal four-way, while Roman Reigns would defend his Universal Championship versus Brock Lesnar. However, on the day of the event, it was revealed that Roman Reigns had to pull out the show due to illness. Mm -hmm. To counteract this, the WWE instead added Lesnar to the WWE title match, making it a five-way. Lesnar would go on to win the match, becoming the new WWE Champion. Brock and Roman were still to have their big match against one another though and this mm -hmm. took place in the main event of wrestlemania 38 given that both men went into the bout each holding a world championship their clash was dubbed as winner take all meaning the victor on the night would be declared the undisputed wwe universal champion roman reign earned this honor by defeating lesnar reigns would now defend both belts as one title going <sighs> forward it was reported that the titles were unified in order to allow reigns to appear on both raw and smackdown more often reigns was now on both shows but his appearances on television as a whole became less and less mm -hmm. frequent while his matches were almost exclusively saved for pay-per-view. As yep. this was happening, Cody Rhodes had just returned to WWE to much fanfare. Cody made it his mission to capture the WWE Championship in order to succeed where uh, his father failed. Have. Although a torn peck halted these plans. Back over on SmackDown, the Bloodline storyline was heating up with Sami Zayn attempting to join the group. This story was played out over several months, getting better and better each week, in no small part thanks to Sami. It was just brilliant to see the slow burn of Zayn <laughs> oh, trying man. to become a member of the Bloodline this and then fine. being made an honorary use so only fine. to fail his final test because he didn't want to hurt his best friend. Sammy had been a great baby face in his first years in WWE, but his work with the Bloodline had taken him to the next level. He yeah. just hasn't been oozy. Very oozy. This made his official face turn at the yep. Royal Rumble so much sweeter. Oh my god, goosebumps. Bruce fans were now clamoring to see Zayn receive a title shot against Roman Reigns yep. and they wanted it to happen in the main event of Wrestlemania. The problem with this was that Cody Rose had made his triumphant return from mm -hmm. injury by winning the 2023 Men's Royal Rumble, meaning the American Nightmare would be the one closing out Wrestlemania to challenge Roman Great for the undisputed match. WWE Universal title. Oh my god, title. so good. This created an interesting situation. Fans were overjoyed to see Cody return and absolutely wanted him to capture the World Championship, but the amazing story that had been told with Roman Reigns, Sami Zayn and the Bloodline deserved to to culminate in the main event of the grandest stage of them all. This brings us back to Reigns falling ill and missing the day one event, where his scheduled opponent on that show, Brock Lesnar, ended up winning the WWE Championship, setting up a unification bout at WrestleMania 38. Had the titles not been unified, then it's very possible we could have seen Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn main event night one of WrestleMania for the Universal title, while Cody Rhodes could have closed out the other mm -hmm. night, challenging for the WWE Championship. Possibly. It would have made sense for Rhodes to challenge the WWE title holder, since Cody made it clear in his first yeah. return promo back That's in crazy. that it was his mission to become WWE champion. Sami Zayn got his singles match versus Roman Reigns at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. Sami received the perfect hometown oh reception God, from the Montreal so crowd. Great. Such a fantastic atmosphere. Oh my God. But Zayn ultimately came up short on the night. Sami was in the right place at the wrong time. And while he could still get his big win against Roman down the line, it won't be at WrestleMania, be in a one-on-one -on -one match or a three-way. As the WWE would be going ahead with their original plan for the WrestleMania main event with Cody Rhodes wrestling Roman Reigns in a singles match for the undisputed Universal Championship. Reigns' illness set off the butterfly effect that led us to the point where Romans eventually had two viable challenges for WrestleMania 39, but only one championship to defeat. Defend. and that brings mm -hmm. us to the end of this video as always if you this was great man go ahead give this a like i'm doing this gotta give this a like that was fantastic
that was that was truly fantastic man yo these are some of the great stories in wrestling that one thing happened a butterfly effect just occurs and now you have a completely different scenario completely different outcomes completely different people and i think that's ultimately fantastic man so comment down below let me know do you guys know of any other butterfly effects something happening that caused a, a butterfly effect that changed the wrestler's career forever or potentially even elevated it you know in a certain way man let me know down below if they weren't listening to this video but i appreciate all the love and support guys show on the channel road to 150k and i'm still gonna speed the youtube wrestling champion of the world appreciate y'all kicking me see y'all next one peace